Thank you. Nice to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's uh, my third time, I think, fourth time on IUPUI's campus, so I'm excited to be here again and have conversations with you all. Um, and I want this to be a conversation, so if you have any questions while I'm um, presenting, please just raise your hand or shout out loud um, so they can hear you because we're taping um, and uh, uh, at any time. And then uh, hopefully um, we'll go through the presentation and then I have some kind of questions I want to throw out at you just so that you can participate in the conversation as well. Um, I think part of it is because this is still a, a great learning process for me um, on how people learn and experience international service learning or global service learning, um, even that is you know up for conversation the differences between those things um, can everybody hear me okay great just let me know if i need to re talk a little bit louder um, and then i have some handouts here that i'll give you if you're interested or i can share some of the research that i've done over the years um, i'd be happy to do that uh, today what I, i'm going to really focus on is a particular kind of learning transformational learning and um, but before i talk about sort of my understanding welcome understanding of that. Um, I'd like to just, um, if we could go to the first slide. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my own experience uh, as an educator and as a student. I mean, I'm still a learner. Um, so in 1981, uh, I had my first sort of uh, immersive um, international experience. I was a Rotary Exchange uh, student in, in Luleå, Sweden. Lule, what they say in Sweden. Uh, for a year, and I lived with a host family, and I went to a gymnasium there, school. And everyone spoke Swedish to me. I didn't speak Swedish before I went there. Um, I had no idea where I was going pre-internet. We thought there was like beds of hay and reindeer and I'd meet Santa Claus. And so really, I mean, it was very difficult to communicate uh, with a place that was 60 kilometers below the Arctic Circle. And um, not surprised. And I had a lot of potential for learning um, as someone who grew up in a small town in central New York, Ithaca, New York. Um, I had gone to Canada, to Toronto a few times, and we used to just go over to the border and hop back and forth and say we were in Canada a hundred times. So, um, so I was, you know, a, a world traveler having been to Canada a hundred times. Um, and so not surprisingly, uh, my year in Sweden, I experienced love, death, a new language. I learned how to play a new instrument. Um, I learned about all sorts of perspectives that I would, had never gotten about the United States. Um, from people in the northern part of Sweden, which is different than the southern part of Sweden. So it was massively eye-opening. Um, and I guess you could say if I had been reflecting, I, I was writing a journal, but I had no framework for how to write in a journal. I was just sort of writing my thoughts down. I actually started writing poetry just randomly. Nobody told me to write poetry, but it helped me understand the meaning of the experience. But again, I had no training in that. I didn't do a pre-orientation. There was a language school that I went to um, prior to that for about two weeks, but two weeks of Swedish, you know, I wasn't fluent. Um, so it was a fascinating experience, and when I reflect on it now, I do think it was transformational, and uh, I didn't know that there were theories in transformation um, that had been developed um, that sort of predated that experience a little bit. Um, and then fast forward, you know, that really triggered an interest for me to study abroad a lot more. So throughout college, I studied abroad, and then after I graduated from college, I traveled across the country, which was like an abroad experience, a couple of times in a car, stopped in a lot of places and worked my way through that, and worked in a lot of interesting communities. Um, and then I spent about, um, uh, about 10 years, uh, the next 10 years, living in different countries, uh, living out of a backpack in many cases, studying always. I always matriculated. You know, some places you can matric matriculate for nothing. So I was always a student. I always had some student form of visa, helped me stay in certain places. Um, and, uh, and I worked overseas and so managed to get a, uh, a degree overseas uh, at the University of Madrid. Lived in Madrid for four years, Mexico, Greece, lots of different places. Um, uh, I was in Madrid from 87 to 91. And so when the Berlin Wall came down, I was there, which was an incredibly powerful experience and transformational in a different sense for a lot of people. And I guess what I'm trying to say is I had a lot of experiences overseas um, for a long time, from about 1981 to 1992. That's pretty much all I did. Um, and then uh, I did my master's in international relations, came back to Ithaca, and I started teaching at a community college. And a nursing professor there and I got really close. We were on an internationalization task force 
the community college wanted to internationalize. Uh, it was sort of right around the time when globalization was becoming a term. Again, this is pre-European community, pre-NAFTA, pre-regions getting together. Lots of thinking about that. What's going to happen after the bipolar world, right? You know, Cold War. Um, what are we looking at? So lots of theories around international relations. It was all over this messy paradigm shift, right? And so I, was, uh, I wanted to kind of establish that context a little bit. So my conversations with my colleagues at the community college about globalization, um, uh, outsourcing was just happening. They were very local centered. Um, and so when some companies started uh, outsourcing, the global started getting much more relevance to business faculty and other faculty there that wouldn't have thought about teaching in that area. There was very little study abroad at the community college, no center. We had a big student, uh, international student population because of um, spouses and children uh, visiting faculty at Cornell University, which was just down the road, and Ithaca College. And so it was a really interesting time period for me, having been overseas, having b had many, many conversations about the future of Europe and the European community, the future of the world after the Cold War. Um, you know, what would it look like? How would we approach nation states getting along, hopefully? And, um, and so in that context, I was on this internationalization task force, and this nursing professor approached me who was on there. We got to be good friends. And she said, you seem kind of adventurous, and you speak Spanish fluently. I had this amazing transformational experience in Haiti when I was an 18-year-old. At the time, she was in her 40s. Um, her kids were, she had kids different ages, but she was a little bit ready to create a practicum. And, uh, and she wanted to go to Haiti at first, uh, but because of some issues there, we turned to Nicaragua, which had just come uh, out of and still was experiencing a little bit of the Civil War there. And so we had connections in Nicaragua, and she said, I'd like to create a practicum for our nursing students. We had a really robust nursing programs. I was teaching political science, and uh, she said, what do you think about possibly collaborating and creating um, a couple of courses, one that gets at the history, politics, culture, language of the region, and the other one that focuses on international health, and we'll make a contribution to the community. Our nursing students can do health clinics, work at the hospital. There's a lot of possibilities. So we went down to Nicaragua, and we met with some community groups down there. Um, and in fact, we went to Puerto Cabezas, which is right here. So not a lot of uh, places to go to, just a big jungle area. Um, and it's fascinating. If you fly into Managua, um, and uh, if you fly, fly into Managua here, it takes about an hour and 15 minutes to fly in a puddle jumper, you know, those little planes, kind of freaky, flying in those. Um, and uh, if you fly into Managua, if you drove, it would take maybe a day, depending on whether or not the roads were washed out. So, um, you know, it just uh, gives you a sense of the landscape there. Big differences between the Atlantic and Pacific coast. And I had studied Latin America, but I really hadn't studied uh, on the Atlantic coast and the history of that particular region and the cultures and some of the indigenous communities. So it's fascinating for me to, to then spend, that program's now in its 21st year, uh, it's fascinating now to know much more about the Atlantic coast and that region. Um, so I went down there with open eyes uh, and we decided to do a scouting trip and just get to know community members, have some conversations and say, hey, we have this school, we have a nursing program, we'd really like to build a partnership with you all. We're not sure what that looks like. We just want to hear what you think. So we met with as many people as possible and we ended up uh, partnering with a local Creole pastor, Earl Bowie. And, um, and he was really interested in partner partnering with us. And he had a vision, a social vision, that we felt very connected to. It was very synergistic in what we were interested in. Uh, at the time, uh, there was about 90% unemployment. Um, it was sort of a devastated community post-Civil War. Civil Wars are horrible wars because your neighbors are fighting. And it's not a pleasant experience to come out of because you're now trying to work with your neighbors. Um, and there's just a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder happening and people are just still going through a lot of shock. Um, and uh, so there was a, the, the community there was going through that shock uh, and was really interested in partnering uh, with anyone that was interested in helping out. And so he had a vision around building a school, so very, little, very few schools there. They had, uh, um, I think, eighth grade and they wanted to build it all the way up to 12th grade. Um, they had buildings that needed repair. Uh, the hospital was working off a very low budget, mostly in, from international donations, a big region to cover. Uh, there was a doctor in Maine and a group there that helped 
uh, establish the hospital and so they were continually working with them so we partnered with them after a while and we got to know more people in that area um, but it was a struggling region and uh, and they were really interested in partnering with us and thought we could help out so we actually went back and developed our syllabi based on those conversations so we didn't take an existing set of syllabi and fit it into um, that uh, that experience but we rather we created an experience in our conversations and over the years we've always you know changed and adjusted that syllabus based on the um, context and what's happening locally for example in 98 during Hurricane Mitch rather than working in the hospital and doing some of the clinics that we were doing we, we worked with refugees uh, in the northern part of Nicaragua so we shifted our focus and and uh, co the content of our courses around disaster relief and what that looks like so um, so we were very flexible, very open-minded, very committed, um, even though we weren't sure what we were getting ourselves into. It was our, my first experience. So um, we uh, ended up creating these two courses. The biggest, hardest part with the curriculum committee was um, the math component to satisfy certain requirements. And I was really fortunate that uh, one of the other faculty members on the curriculum committee said, have you ever tried to exchange money in like Italy for example at Lira you know it's pretty complicated mathematically anyway people laughed and they ended up approving the course and it satisfied a few requirements uh, particularly for our gen ed and that was important you know so other students could take the course not just nursing students um, and then the international health course was part of the nursing program and so we were recruiting a lot of students there we opened the course up to Cornell students Cortland State students the college students any student could take the course we even offered continuing education credits for uh, practitioners and professionals who would come down with us as well, who had a lot of skills that they could offer and, um, and, uh, and help out, um, as well as uh, train other people who didn't necessarily have those skill sets, particularly younger teenagers where employment was difficult to get, so on carpentry and other types of things. So we were always looking for ways to combine our efforts. We weren't going to teach them how to build boats because they can literally take trees and carve boats out of trees. So that wasn't something we were going to do or teach them how to fish, right? So that whole metaphor was not applicable. Um, and if we have time, I want to talk about that metaphor of giving someone a fish and teaching someone how to fish um, and, and the implications around that metaphor and whether it's a little bit flawed. Uh, so. Uh, we went down, our first experience was in uh, 93, and um, we brought down 10 students, um, and we stayed there for three weeks. We conducted about five health clinics uh, in Puerto Cabezas, outside of Puerto Cabezas, and we partnered with a local free clinic and a hospital so they make sure that we were complementing and supplementing what they were doing, so we didn't just like go out and do the clinic. We actually worked through the hospital and doctors there. They came with us, uh, nurses and translators. And so we had a combined collaborative effort. And then we worked with local leaders, depending on the community that we worked in. And we did all sorts of other things. We met with civic leaders, and we had students working in different organizations, um, including the hospital. We worked with a local orphanage, doing a lot of education. And we were responding to an area that was really, as I said, um, still living that sort of post-war experience and struggling uh, deeply. And we also worked with a fairly marginalized community that had built um, housing on the s outskirts of this this community um, and along the um, along the beach, and so we we specifically focused focused on this community called Moy Community, um, and got to know some of the leaders there and and started building some partnerships with them because we wa we were looking long term, um, and we're very committed to working with this community and uh, so when we came back, um, I I. Uh, having lived overseas for many many years um, I had never experienced anything like that in three weeks so you know in the study abroad literature there's a lot of debate on whether or not you have to go for a semester a year or five years or then what you learn and I found that my learning was different and it was incredibly powerful and the dissonance was much more extensive than I'd ever experienced um, I was very much outside my frame of reference and the students also many of the students we're experiencing a similar um, um, kind of dissonance and it wasn't going away and I did not feel prepared as an educator even though I had lived overseas for many years done a lot of workshops you know did the whole pre-orientation post you know orientations and I did not feel prepared to um, respond to some of the challenges that students were going through 
when they would come into my office and say, I can't go to sleep at night. I'm washing my clothes in the bathtub. I'm not sure. Um, my entire lifestyle, I'm challenging everything. I can't talk to my family. My church doesn't understand me. My most trusted friends, it looks like they don't even really care about what I've ex experienced. And I have no idea what I want to do with this community, but I feel deeply connected to that community. And I'm unsure. It's, it's disrupted my entire life. I'm not even sure if I want to... Um, if I want to pursue the degree program that I'm in, um, my husband thinks I'm nuts and I'm really worried about whether or not we're going to be able to stay together. And so here I am thinking, what did I do? You know, and I, had, uh, I was somewhat well-read in, in certain literature that talks about engaging students in social justice. And I thought I was raising their critical awareness around this work and that it was a really positive thing. Um, and I was finding um, that initial return that it wasn't. The re-entry was incredibly difficult. And fortunately uh, for me, my wife and I were, um, or the, the woman that uh, would become my wife, my girlfriend at the time, she was also very supportive of this kind of work. So I at least had one person I could talk to, but my family had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and they are very educated, you know, good people, um, well-intentioned. And a lot of the, my, my colleagues in the, in the college, there was no other program like that. So what did I do? Um, Cornell's there. They got a big library, lots of resources, um, card catalog, ready to go. Back in the card catalog days, I might get five books if I can carry them. So I went back and I looked for some research. There were some studies on Peace Corps volunteers, but it's a little bit of a different kind of an experience. Um, longer term, maybe not as immersive and intense, a um, little more incremental. Uh, there were very few studies, and I, there was really, I couldn't find anything. I'd sent emails out on the Sakusa listserv for some of you that, are, that know about that. I got two emails back. It was just kind of in the beginnings of email. And one, some, one person said, wow, I didn't know anybody else did this. Tell me if you find anything. And the other person said, help me, you know, something like that. So, uh, so this became a really big interest of mine. One, because it just changed the way I thought of myself as an educator. And I wanted to really respond to my students and do this more effectively. And the relationships that we started developing in Puerto Cabezas were incredibly powerful in such a short period of time. I felt deeper connections with people there than I had felt in my entire life, with people that I had lived with for years in other countries. So there was something very different. And I was thinking, is this just unique to me and my students? Or have, you know, are other people experiencing similar things? And how is this different than my own experience having lived in a number of countries and had what I thought was a transformative experience. And this is something very different. So on that note, I want to throw this back at you. So in the literature, so I went and I found a lot of cool theories. But it took me a while. And there's, I didn't even realize there was a theory called transformational learning theory when I started doing this. And it's a very sophisticated theory. It's probably the most important adult learning theory over the past 30 years. Right? It's been out there for a long time. The study abroad world's now getting acquainted somewhat with it. But it's a really important uh, theory in adult learning theory. Lots of journal articles, lots of dissertations. It's kind of like when you look at uh, David Kolb's work. If there's a great website where they have like you know 20 years of research on Kolb's work, Mesro, Jack Mesro coined the term transformational learning um, based on a, his dissertation uh, back in the late 70s. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research on this. So I'd like to go through that a little bit and talk to you about pieces of that theory. And I've done this presentation now, uh, presentations like this, in many different places. You would be amazed at the amount of students and faculty that have come up to me and talked to me about some of the research in this area and the patterns of experiences and how aligned they are um, and how people are very much struggling after going through some of this transformational learning process. So I want to throw this back to you all and just ask you, when students come back from these trips, whether it's a study abroad trip or a service learning trip, and they say, I'm a totally different person, my life has changed, however they describe it, whatever they term, what do you think that means? Just throw out stuff. When you hear transformation, what do you think that means? They're thinking it. In what way? Okay, so it's tough to get it specific, though, right? Because I was really interested. They kept telling me I'm totally different, and I kept asking myself, "What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm seeing everything differently. What do you mean by that? What else? Yeah, could you?" I think transformation, your change within your soul. 
Okay. Yeah, and I agree with you. And imagine coming up to a student and say, Could, we're doing some assessment. Could you describe that in very specific, measurable ways? <laughs> right? That's pretty hard to do. Um, I've spent years on that particular way of describing what a change in the soul might look like. And it's really fascinating, even just, uh, who mentioned not, it's not cog cognitive, uh, even trying to use words is very complicated when you're trying to represent certain kinds of learning. You were going to say something, or did someone else have their hands raised? Yes, please. Um, I think as a student, as an undergraduate student, and a graduate student that has studied abroad, um, and even working with service learning students here, I think it's certain things that for, before you went, there were certain things that you could ignore and move on. Yeah. But after the experience, you can't ignore it anymore, and you begin to ask questions that you didn't know you were even supposed to ask. And what, can you be more specific? Like what are some of the, this is the thing that I was challenged with in 1993. Getting a little bit more specific on the meaning of the experience. So there's something that you're questioning. What is it? Is it yourself? Is it others? Is it the world? Is it institutions, policies? What is it that you're, you're now thinking about? Uh, you, yeah, sorry, I don't know your names, but Andrea. how about Andrea? Oh, yeah, Andrea. <laughs> and then, um, come on, and then maybe you. didn't know you had that perspective, that you had that emotion, or that you had that reaction, and finding out for yourself, you're like, I like it, or I don't, or that's really unsettling, I didn't, I don't know what to do with that, um, but the experience um, allows them to question, you know, truth is, you know, designed well, you know, like it really helps them to unpack self and others, and the experience. Great. And before uh, you comment, let me just throw out a quick little question that you don't have to answer. But there's an experiment that I do in a lot of my classes. I'll just look at somebody, and some of you might have been in an earlier presentation, and I'll just say, hey, tell me a little bit about your consciousness. <laughs> and of course, they look at me like the deer in the headlights. And then I'll say, but you're conscious, right? And they'll say, yeah, of course I'm conscious. We're talking. So, but you, you can't tell me about your consciousness. That's interesting. And what you're referring to, and when I started looking into the theory around this, is that triggers this evaluation of a frame of reference that they hadn't even thought about. They didn't even know that it necessarily existed and how it existed and how it filtered their values, their beliefs, their actions, their approach to life. And I wanted to start up their soul. I wanted to start unpacking that. Really understanding, when you say soul, what do you mean by that? Because I really want to know, and what was important to me when I started doing my doctorate on this, how does it translate into action? That was really important to me. It wasn't just, I live in despair now, because I see things that I had never seen before, and I'm just catatonic. That's the last thing I wanted to happen. And so I was very interested in that relationship between the shift in whatever it is, soul, uh, cognition, epistemology, moral beliefs, whatever it is, I wanted to see... How, is there patterns in the way that people are shifting and are there patterns in the actions that they take? And then importantly, what are the challenges? So if somebody says, I want to change the system and these specific things, okay, <laughs> that's going to be a really difficult journey and I want to make sure you're prepared for that. And if I'm, creating a, if I'm helping create an experience that's causing you to think that way and want to act that way, what things can I do throughout the process before we go, while we are there and afterwards to make sure that you aren't that person who feels really isolated and frustrated because then that's not a really powerful, positive learning experience for me. So that's what I was really, I just want you to understand kind of where I was really trying to grapple with this, you know, 20 years ago. Yes? Yeah, hi. It's about social constructs in my students' minds. I see, I challenge them with that. I take them in a post-war Croatia safe area. But 
quite ethnically traumatized yes. because of their internal war. So there they come with their sense of righteousness and wrongness, and that common morality gets filtered through their souls and minds because they see these kids playing with the ball, and then you have the fans, and it says mine. Right. And then you begin thinking of that, and then you see the fights that existed between them. It's still visual. They are with, and then they, 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 it's beyond them to understand what happened and how they can move forward. Mm -hmm. So that awakening coming from, you know, we in our cultures who have our own patterns of developing that sense of rightness and wrongness, and you go there, and there you are. And then it, it transforms them in many ways, awake to them to, as learners and, and questioning who they are, what they want to do. Yeah, and it sounds like it's not, it, not just cognitive. It's yeah. very visceral, it's very emotional. So there's something about the visceral of being there, somatic learning, and there's something about the emotional of being there that also influences the cognitive processes that are happening. And again, that soul, wherever that is, that soul and whatever that constitutes is also might be, might be being shaped or influenced by that being there. Uh, you were going to say something as well. Yeah, <clears throat> I look at it as a paradigm shift. And one of the big things for these students, I think, is many of them don't realize how their thoughts and, and their feelings have been formed, you know, what the things around them have, have done in terms of their mindset. Yeah. So they need to go back and examine how their opinions, their beliefs, their, their rationale came to being before they can come to terms with what they're seeing in a totally different set. It's a really good point. So some of these taken for granted dimensions of their frame of reference, consciousness, paradigm, however you want to frame that. Uh, when you start at, when I, usually what I'll do after that consciousness question or worldview or what have you, is I'll say, okay, who can tell me the sources of their consciousness? And again, that's sort of a process of infinite regression. You keep going back and back, and it's really hard to document the source. And that is a fairly debilitating realization, can be very disruptive for someone that has a set of assumptions that, they, that stabilizes them. It's their foundation. So imagine if it is spiritual. Uh, imagine someone that's guided by a set of spiritual assumptions that have now been exploded. That's a really, really disruptive process. And so for me, the question was, one question was, one, I don't even have the skill set to do that, so to expect my students to do that is really um, unethical. And so for me, and this is one of the things that I've been trying to do over the last 20 years, is to explain to people that transformation isn't just a butterfly, right? Metamorphosis into a beautiful, colorful thing. And global service learning, unlike, and uh, apologies in advance to study abroad folks, because remember, I studied abroad for many years, is a very different kind of transformation. And I wanted to make sure that I isolated what those differences were. And that has a lot to do with the action piece. It's not only the shift, but it's also the kinds of actions where, which aren't just individualized. It might even be a whole entire system that has been historically constructed that they want to break down. So it's not necessarily expanding horizons, it's changing the horizon itself, which is pretty intense, right? That's an intense endeavor. So if we're setting people up for that, what I started becoming very interested in, what I started learning about in transformational learning theory, is there are reflective frameworks that help bring people through that process. Obviously, it's not uh, you know, a solution, but it's a helpful process. And so it's not just saying, go reflect. It's here are some frameworks also to help you reflect. And it's different than the kinds of reflection that I would use possibly in a study abroad experience. Yes? around smell, about other types of senses that we don't typically tune into. And by making ourselves more mindful of those dimensions, it starts to open up a space to think about effective psychomotor dimensions of learning and how that relates to cognitive dimensions of learning. And I think that's part of that, that, that embodied piece, I think is an important part of transformational learning as well. Yeah, to tap into those senses. And it's hard for students to think about that if they're most of their educational experiences in a classroom where those types of learning modes 
are downplayed or neglected. It's rare when a professor says, okay, just checking on the emotional tone, right? How are you doing today? What was your life like? Was school off today? Do you have kids? What's going on? Where are you emotionally? That really happens, and that opens up a big bag of possible uh, in, uh, things that aren't in the control of the faculty member. So again, as an educator, I had to think, am I willing to actually go there, open myself up to all of these learning modes when I don't feel like I'm even prepared to do that? So uh, if you go to the next slide. OK, so uh, when I was digging, so I had this really cool opportunity. I applied at Cornell, got a nice grant. And for some strange reason, they accepted me into a doctoral program. And guess what I got to do? I got to do the ultimate dissertation. I had a program, and I got to study all the issues and challenges with that program. So all I was doing was just asking questions. Can higher ed partner with communities? What does the pedagogy look like? Is there a learning theory around this? Well, how do institutions support this? So I looked. So at the end of this, 20 years later, there are traditions under organizational change that help support this. There are traditions under learning theory and pedagogy and andragogy that help support this. There are learning theories around knowledge generation or research that support this. If it's community-based research and you're co-constructing knowledge with community members, right, and applying it in a different way. And then there's really interesting community development theories that inform this work. And so I just, I didn't want to limit myself. I thought this was just an incredibly holistic engagement. And I wanted to understand all the different dimensions. And I had this great opportunity, um, you know, for four years. To, and my, and I, every faculty member, I said, I know you're teaching a course on community development, but I'm really interested in how do you work with incredibly resource poor communities from a higher education standpoint? A lot, a lot of literature around that. And often the faculty member would say, oh, I'm not really sure, but sounds like you have a cool problem that you're trying to you know, engage in. And so fortunately, people were very open-minded to me doing a lot of reflective research on a practical problem, investigating it, and then going into that context and saying, wow, this worked, it didn't work, and then coming back and saying, huh, re-entry, how do we think about that? Is it different than what I know in the literature? Study abroad literature, is there something else going on? So I found Jack Mesereau. Now Mesereau had done a study on, uh, and for the women in the room, you might reflect on this a little bit. He'd done a study on what happens to women in the 70s going back to school, right? Being moms their whole life, and then going back to school. And then seeing women that are taking positions, employment, taking on different kinds of roles, something was happening. They were changing their identity. And if you've read uh, Betty Friedan's uh, The Feminine Mystique and sort of the pathological tendencies that she talks about of uh, being stuck in a particular identity and then seeing all these other kinds of opportunities and different types of identities and wondering, do I actually control my identity or is it being defined for me? What is my identity? So a very disruptive experience. And he started looking at, he started seeing patterns and how women were experiencing that process. So that's what he looked at. And he came out with this theory called transformational learning theory. Uh, and part of that is perspective transformation. And I think that's what we try to document when we're studying this, is what is the transformation. I tend to look at it as a process and something that's always shaped and formed over time. It's not just like I'm transformed and now I never will be again. right? Your frame of reference is always expanding or shifting within your frame of reference or sometimes it's the entire shift of your frame of reference depending on the experiences that you're having, whether they're traumatic, someone has a traumatic experience and they're a very different person, or incremental. An incremental set of, going to that paradigm shift, set of anomalies that are making you question who you are. So it could be, in, over, over time, research has looked at, is this incremental, is this traumatic, and it can be both. And this, and this is why study abroad literature, why I have issues with the semester year long type of thing, is that people can have traumatic, intense, dissonant experiences that are, in, that are very powerful learning processes that are discounted because we're focused on language outcomes. And of course, in three weeks, unless you're a genius, it's really tough to learn a language. But that neglects lots of other learning that's taking place, right? We just talked about emotional, moral, spiritual, cognitive. There's lots of other learning processes taking place. So Mesereau, when he looked at this, he said it's perspective transformation is the process of becoming critically aware of how and why our presuppositions behind our values, beliefs, and actions. That's that curtain that we often don't know what it is until we've gone to another country and it's opened up some spaces that we hadn't seen before. So our presuppositions uh, have come to constrain the way we perceive, understand, and feel about our world of reformulating these assumptions. So there's presuppositions 
to permit a more inclusive, discriminating, permeable, and integrative perspective of making decisions or otherwise acting on these new understandings. So sometimes what people realize is they're resting on a flawed set of assumptions about themselves and the world. So think back to that woman who just says, the only thing that I can ever be in the world is a mom. That's it. And all of society is just repeating that over and over and over again. So it becomes a set of assumptions that are just taken for granted. Right? And then you start seeing these anomalies, other women that are doing things, and maybe a couple guys that might be supportive, allies in this. That's why there's a lot of allying in this world of changing systems, changing beliefs, and, <clears throat> and supporters. And then they're doing consciousness raising, and that's how they get at that consciousness. What that is, again, consciousness, they use the term consciousness raising. I want to raise awareness, raise consciousness, change consciousness about the role of who I am. So this is what Mesereau is talking about. But then he's saying there's an action part of it. This is the hard part. There could be a whole world out there that's acting against you wanting to transform. And that's this really interesting re-entry that global service learning causes. You're witnessing structural dimensions to problems, not just an individual, an individual being affected. So it might be about individual change, but it's also there's structural dimensions to that, which are really hard to change. Could take years to change. Think of any social movement. So students experiencing this, when they come back, what I was interested in is not only the individual transformation, but also the social transformation. And if what I was creating as an educator and helping create with these students was leading them, how were they experiencing that social transformation aspect? And that's a really important difference that I want to emphasize. If there's any takeaway from this, is it's not just about the individual transformation, it's the relationship between individual and social transformation. And the contested dimensions of that, the tensions in that, which I, uh, later on I'll talk about what I gave, I gave a term to that. So, um, so a frame of reference, it sort of acts as this interpretive filter that allows us to give meaning to our experience, but it's like a double-edged sword. Our frame of reference gives both meaning, but it also distorts our experience, right? And if we're not reflecting and a certain kind, and using certain frameworks around reflecting, we may not ever get at some of those assumptions that could be critically flawed, and you could be causing harm to yourself and others, and not even know it. You might even be complicit in causing harm. But if we haven't been taught how to think about our complicity, that's a really hard thing to do, to be in your fishbowl and reflect on the harmful dimensions of that fishbowl, if you don't even know the fishbowl exists, right? And you don't even know your own consciousness within that fishbowl exists. This is a really hard kind of learning, a very, very challenging kind of learning. And Mesereau's work, he, he, he explores, and other people after him, what kinds of um, preparation uh, have to be in place to have someone be willingly accepting the critical examination of their assumptions. And then the other person, the educator, how do you help so facilitate that, right, if someone's not willing to examine their assumptions? Okay. So uh, for Mesereau, he looked at a little bit at some of the different kinds of frames of reference. So some are sociolinguistic, moral, ethical, philosophical, spiritual, psychological, aesthetic. Go ahead. Um, and he documented a process. So a lot of people use the term dissonance, disjuncture. Um, he uses disorienting dilemma. So typically when we uh, experience something outside our frame of reference, we don't have anywhere to draw from. It causes this disorientation, and he said it, it, it triggers a self-examination, and it often is emotional. There's emotions attached to it. Um, and then there's, and again, think about an educator in this process helping facilitate these processes, supporting someone through this. Uh, a critical assessment of assumptions, or otherwise known as reflection. Recognition of one's discontent in the process of a transformation is shared with others. So there's a social dimension to this. It's not just an individual reflection. Exploration of options for new roles, relationships, and actions. Planning a course of action. Acquiring knowledge and skills for implementing one's plans. Provisional trying of new roles. Building confidence and self-confidence in new roles and relationships. And then a reintegration into one's life on the basis of conditions dictated by one's new uh, perspective. So here's 11, I think 10 or 11 processes that Mesereau documented this pattern. And so as an educator, how do we facilitate this process and unpack each one of those, right? And if you think about uh, an experience over time, there's a pre, or it could be a pre-pre. <laughs> so just preparation for engaging in this work. Are you even open-minded enough to engage in the pre? 
right? My students actually told me that there has to be a pre-pre. Because, you know, there are one of our assumptions that people have been trained in reflection, and then you're starting to ask them to do really deep forms of reflection that shift, the, that are literally getting at there's something they never do, right? Which is, usually it's informational learning, not transformational learning that they're getting, right? They're not examining their assumptions. And that's intimidating for students when you start with them and their frame of reference as opposed to a text. It's a very intimidating kind of learning. And we're expecting people to actually do that when they've never had any training in it. So that's why I spend a lot of time with different frameworks for reflection, for that process of the self-examination. And then are we prepared for the emotions that go along with that? So these are really important questions for a facilitator of transformational learning. So the next slide. Uh, so here's, uh, in the service learning world, uh, I learned Giles were the first to actually bring Mesero's work into the service learning world, which is interesting. And they did a study, and it's uh, in a book called Where's the Learning in Service Learning? If you're interested in service learning, local or uh, global or domestic or anything, I would highly recommend you reading that book. It's a really comprehensive book. Uh, it's a large mixed method study. Uh, and they documented all sorts of things, different types of learning. And they did bring in Mesero, not the process, but the, the, the outcome, the perspective transformation. So they never talk really about those stages in the process. So it's not about accumulating more knowledge, but about seeing the world in a profoundly different way, one that calls for personal commitment and action. And that's that service learning dimension. I did a lot of study abroad, but I wasn't talking, thinking about changing the world when I got back. I wasn't thinking about my contribution to Madrid or the European community or flaws in how Spain looked at North Africans, right, and some of the issues around that, um, race, and, race and ethnic issues, ethnicity issues. So I wasn't thinking about the world capitalist system. I just wasn't in that mode of thinking because I wasn't in... I wasn't having an educational experience that was compelling me to think about those issues. Um, and so they found in service learning is what some patterns in students' perspective transformation were questioning and overturning one's fundamental s assumptions in society, viewing social problems in a new way, demonstrating a more systemic locus for causes and solutions to problems. For Americans, that's really important because they tend to be highly individualistic in how they look at problems. If they only worked harder, they'd be fine. If they just developed those skills and competencies, they'd be fine. Right? Demonstrating, so demonstrating more systemic locus for causes and solutions to problems. Service learning is very problem-oriented. So again, in study abroad, you might not be saying, what are all the problems here in this community and how do I figure it out? That's fundamental to service learning. That's going to shift the way people think about their educational experience when they come back. It's still going to be about those social problems and the sources and solutions of those. A belief in the importance of social justice, the need to change public policy, the need to influence political structure personally. Those are really, really difficult sets of actions, right? <coughs> and so if we're setting students up for that, we have to really be careful about how we've structured our curriculum. Okay, so it's not just a one-shot deal. You can't just teach a course and say, good luck with that. I think that's unethical, personally. So uh, some of the tensions over the last 40 years, 45 years, with this theory making, the role of context. So if I take students to Nicaragua, is it different to taking a student to Costa Rica? If it's an American student, it's going to Nicaragua. Is it different than a Costa Rican student going to Nicaragua? What about the way I structure my program? Does that influence it? Um, how about my own role and my philosophy of teaching as an educator? How does that influence it? So context is really important. Uh, the learning process. So different pieces of those stages are also, there's a lot of tension around that. Are there different kinds of reflection? What are the roles of emotion? How do we engage in dialogue? If, it's a so, if there's a social dimension to that, are we trained in how to do dialogue? Which is different than discussion and debate, right? A lot of feminist theory weighs into dialogue and how we think about engaging in mutual understanding rather than judging right or wrong. That's a different kind of process, right? Do you have the best set of assumptions? Is there a way of testing that? <laughs> Someone will come up with it, right? There's one set of some other that the best conflict comes out of that one, right? So open dialogue is a really difficult process to learn. I have not met too many people that are really highly trained in critical forms of reflection, which force you to look at structure and systems as opposed to personal, and dialogue, which is a really difficult thing to do. If you want to, if you're open-minded, you have access to information, the relations of power are fairly equitable, <laughs> right? These are really hard things to do. Okay, so the role of the affective and emotional learning and the Mesro's theory draws heavily from Habermas, which is a very cognitive rationalistic theory. So the role of emotions was sort of under theorized in his theory. Uh, and the relationship between individual and social transformation. 
guess what I tried to do <laughs> in my dissertation? I wanted to look at all those things. Because service learning was a perfect context to look at all those things. Because you see all of that come out. Okay, so then I conducted this longitudinal case study, which was awesome because I had a lot of, I could watch people over time. Like, does this transformation persist? Does it change? What does it look like? Um, how does it relate to their social life, personal life, employment, career? Uh, and then, um, and this is what I came up with, and we're not going to be able to go through all this. I found patterns in the kind of transformation, intellectual, moral, political, cultural, personal, and spiritual, which gets to that soul dimension. Each one of those categories has different representations. So again, it's not just, some people had very difficult time talking about their spiritual transformation and representing that um, because it was so profoundly deep. Uh, so I found it very difficult to unpack the spiritual dimension of, of their transformation. The intellectual, moral, political, and cultural, I have some handouts here that talk a little bit about the characteristics of those patterns. So I'm happy to share that with you. And then I found some processes that were very interesting. Contextual nature of this experience is really important, and I identified four types of context. One is programmatic, so the type of program influences how people experience the learning process, the transformational learning process. If I don't talk about critical reflection and how to reflect that way, it's going to have a very different kind of impact on their experience. And if I don't give them frameworks and train them in those frameworks, it's going to be very hard for them to think about structural dimensions of problems. So I get very frustrated if I see someone not really training students in reflection because it's really hard to do this work. Um, so context is important. So history is important. There's a historical dimension to the relationships that you develop in a particular context. Uh, it's going to influence the learning experience. Uh, and it's going to influence the rest of those processes. So programmatic, historical. One's biography is going to influence the experience. So our collective biographies and how we understand our frame of reference is going to influence how we experience uh, transformation. So we have programmatic, historical, uh, structural, so race, class, gender, sexual orientation, um, nationality, all of those structures also influence the experience. Um, so testing for that on a pre-basis is really complicated, right? How do you uh, evaluate context before you, if you really want to understand the kind of learning prior to this, and how do you structure a program? Uh, it's fascinating uh, trying to focus on all those dimensions. And I'm sure there are more contextual factors. Those are just four big categories. Dissonance I found really important. Uh, I distinguish between low intensity dissonance, which tends to uh, trigger instrumental learning. And that's like you go to the market and you can't speak the language very well and you're struggling with that. Well, the only thing you need to do is just improve your language and you can do that. It's pretty much in your control. You just practice it, right? But or if you see that there's water that's not clean, you know, you can literally, if you take engineers, they can be like, well, if you boil it in this degree, it's like so accurate. And you put this chloro in there and uh, you clean the water, you're all fine. And then it's like, and then you see somebody, an entire community that doesn't have access to clean water. That's not necessarily a technical problem, right? It could be a practical problem. It could be even overturning a whole system, right? So that's a very different kind of education. And if you're just getting technical skills and you think that's going to solve the world, that's problematic. So dissonance like that is high intensity because it's ambiguous. There is no textbook for solving why this group of people has water and that group uh, doesn't. Right? And it might be an historical problem. Yes? I belong to the Rotary Club of Indianapolis, but Rotary International has different areas of focus. Yep. Which is water. It's a big one. Water. Anyway, we have projects all over the world in Haiti and Uganda and Kenya and um, every single place is Taken that we think the 
technology or we just boil it or we'll just do this and this and that fix but it's so much deeper. Yeah. And it's, so it's important, you know, as I mentioned before, those four dimensions, uh, whether, I don't know if you remember them, but pedagogy, institutional change, community development, and knowledge making and application, all of which have multiple traditions. Uh, what's important is if I go to Puerto Cabezas and I'm working with fishermen, and they are the best, most highly skilled fishermen I've ever met in my life, they can literally take a tree and make a boat out of it, right? But they don't have, ac they don't have any fish, they're, they're starving. And there's ocean right there. What's going on, guys? We don't have access to that water. Not a technical problem, right? So that's a really frustrating. Where do you go for that? Highly ambiguous. Who do I talk to? Do I talk to your mom? Do I talk to your cousin? Do I talk to the mayor? Do I talk to go to Managua? Very complicated problem. Very frustrating for a student. If I see a kid eating out of a garbage pile, who do I talk to about the source of that problem? Right? And you're from another country. Go back to context. It's a historical problem. Where do I focus on that? And so what I want students to come out of this with, wow, this is complicated. And I want them to listen to people and I want them to say the health minister thinks this is what we need to do about the wells that aren't covered really well. I want them to think about the person that's struggling with their well. I want them to think about the doctor, the nurse, the technician. I want to expose them to as many perspectives as possible and critically examine the assumptions embedded in those perspectives and have a more holistic understanding, technical, practical and, if necessary, transformational, which means a transformation of the political structure that influences that problem. I love Rotary, by the way. I'm a Rotarian, have been for many years, uh, have done pro uh, projects through Rotary. I chair two committees in Rotary, the RILA and the Outbound. So it's an amazing organization. It's actually one of the, I had this epiphany a, a couple years ago, having done this for many years. But I, what I love about Rotary, there's no reflective stuff in Rotary, so I have a problem with that. But what I love about Rotary is they do have a framework that's very interesting. If you're into the post-colonial literature, right, a lot of countries have been colonized. What's really interesting about Rotary is it's not a bunch of Americans going to a country and imposing what they think that country should do because they're smarter and have more resources. Actually, there's so many Rotary clubs all over the world that are locally driven and all of the community development that happens is locally driven. And so a Rotary club from Denmark would say, we would like to help with that. A Rotary club from Nicaragua would say, we can help with that. It's such an interesting model that I've been thinking a lot more about how Rotary does that. But learning processes in Rotary, not a lot going on there, including in RILA and Rotary Exchange and all that. I wish I had more when I went to Sweden. Yes? Okay, before I ask you a question, is there going to be a Q&A after? Yeah, we can, we can. Okay, we have a choice here. I have pictures, but we don't have to look at pictures because I've covered everything that I want to cover, but it just walks you through what it looks like for a student. I can go for those really quickly and show you those processes if, that, if you want to really quickly. Um, the other couple things I want to mention is when I mentioned that personal biography, the personalizing, students have a personal response to all of this, and so that's really important as part of the learning res response. Some students, that dissonance, when I mentioned dissonance, I noticed a relationship. So. Culture shock is a big monolithic term in study abroad that drove me nuts. Like, let's unpack that term a little bit. Because it's not the same. The U curve, the W curve, people heard about those things. That just, that's been discounted. So please get rid of, in your mind, U curve, W curve. People experience the curve in a variety of different ways depending on the type of experience. Right? So get rid of the U curve and the W curve. And I won't go into that, but it's a model that's influenced the study abroad world, as well as culture shock. So I took dissonance and I said, there are so many different types of dissonance and we need to identify the types of dissonance and the kind of learning. So again, if you're at the market, it's instrumental learning, you can control that. If you see a scorpion and you freak out, three weeks later, you're not going to be freaking out about that scorpion. The heat, all these things people tend to become accustomed to through instrumental learning. Right? They ask questions, they can control that. See a kid eating, gar eating garbage in a garbage pile, that's not going away. That's called high intensity dissonance. There isn't an instrumental thing that you can do to solve that problem. You can't say, here's a lot of food and you're okay for today. You just can't do that. It's, you have to then investigate, who do I talk to to understand why this group of kids is constantly searching in garbage cans, right? Why does this group not have water? It could take 30 or 40 years to solve that problem. It's not an instrumental learning problem. It means you've got to talk to a lot of people and a lot of people have different ways of interpreting that problem. 
Right? So now it's a practical problem, and we don't spend a lot of time with reflecting and dialoguing with people. So we need to train students to do that. And then if it's systemic, then what do you do? And if your country is complicit in that and their foreign policy, like debt relief or forgiveness, right? and you might be able to influence that, which could be part of the problem. So it's really, think about the student that gets out of this and like, what's my role now? So it's very heavily personalized. The other piece is the connecting. That's just getting connected with lots of different uh, people. Processing is a reflection. I call it processing because I want to make sure people realize there's a lot of different kinds of processing that takes place. Uh, and then this thing called emerging global consciousness. So I didn't call it global consciousness because it's not something that's just static. It's emerging, a frame of reference. You're still taking in information and experiencing, and it's transforming. And what I found was in the literature, Eiler and Giles, for example, since their study was just after a program, they found the intention to act. They're envisioned. So people come back and they're like, I'm going to make a difference in the world. And then life happens. And that's what I was studying. And so they have these possibly, they're transforming possibly in six different areas. Not everyone does. And so that's really causing a big disruption in their mind. And it's those, each of those six areas translate into different kinds of actions. And there are patterns around that. And then this chameleon complex is, I think, the most important finding of the entire study, other than those, those processes, which I think you could unpack each one of those and study those for a lifetime. The chameleon complex is that tension between individual and social transformation when you come back. So they get in front of people, their colleagues, their family, their church, their husband, their wife, and they have this, these six transforming forms happening in their mind. They're questioning them themselves, others, the problem, the horizon, and they're trying to communicate that with somebody. How does that person on the other side respond? They're either threatened, they get defensive, they don't understand, they want to ignore it, they're indifferent to it. So what is, or they argue with that person. They're like, just go back to who you were. I want that person back, right? And they're seeing that with their most trusted individuals. So what do they do? They turn into a chameleon. They don't show their true colors. And they're really frustrated with that because everything around them seems like it's completely out of whack. And they want to change it, particularly those structures. And when you start critiquing somebody's structure, which is like their family, it's really hard. Just test it out. Find the most difficult problem that people, you know, whether it's gay marriage, uh, immigration, capitalism, there is no other alternative here in the U.S., so it's really tough to get people to question that one. Private property, things that we just take for granted. Cell phones, you know, you name it. There are things, there are structures in society and dominant discourses, and you start questioning the status quo, and it's like creating, it's like committing cultural suicide. And so what do people do, and I know people have experienced this in the room, is they just, they, they get frustrated and they just go back to who they were or they don't engage in that dialogue because there is no dialogue to engage in. And that's the chameleon complex. And so what, we were, what I was creating was people that were experiencing that. And it's just amazing to me the kinds of things that they have struggled with over the years. And I, they still come up to me when I see them. And it's, it's, very, uh, it's very difficult. So if anything, so what we've done over time and research I've done after that is how do you handle the chameleon complex pre, 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 during, post, and post, post? What are, what's our responsibility as educators to handle that chameleon complex? Okay, so next slide. There we are. We're there. Good. So this is kind of cool. So think about dissonance. We're in uh, Managua about ready to get to Puerto Cabeza and they're weighing our luggage. Right? It's like, and there's a puddle jumper out there. It's like, how come you got to figure out how much we weigh? <laughs> right? That's a little debilitating for me. So she's stepping on the scale. So you can imagine you're in a different place. We go from a whiteout in Ithaca, given the cold weather here, typically, and then we're in this really hot place. Right? So next slide. And then we land on a dirt road. <laughs> it's not a really fancy airport. There's a little latrine there with a hole in the corner. If you got to go to the bathroom, most people have to go to the bathroom after that flight. Um, and then kids. Eight years old, start walking up to you, pulling on your shirt. Will you buy this? Will you buy that? That's a little intimidating, right? The, to get the weather going on. Lots of dissonance. Again, not just culture shock, monolithic. Lots of different senses that are being tapped into. Then these artifacts that you talk about in Croatia, right? The artifacts of the... So you've got these... So this is the dirt road, the truck. That truck's bottomed out so many times. There's no headlights. There's no lights anywhere. So when we go do remote clinics where you can only get to by boat, some, you know, the, the Earl who drives the truck always says, you know, get back before it gets dark because there's chickens and people and roads washed out everywhere. So it's very dangerous. So just potholes, they see that very differently. 
They never complain about potholes anymore. These are the latrines. So we do clinics in that area. And I hadn't seen those latrines the first couple of years. Everybody has parasites. And then you look at the beach, and I won't tell you the, the metaphor we use for this, but you got the piggies, and you got the mud, and mixed in with you know what, and then the kids, and they're swimming. We once had a student who stepped in that. I don't think they ever got over it. You know, years later, they're still washing their leg. So uh, again, sources of, of some of the problems that you're seeing. Go ahead. This is a market. It's the, it's the mosquito market. That pile of garbage, there's no trash pickup. Gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. The smells, again, getting to all those senses. We realized that if we took people there the first day, they'd want to go home the next day. And they did. And it was too intense. So we also recognize that as an educator, there's a sequence to how you expose people to different types of uh, dissonance. One thing I didn't mention about dissonance, there's low intensity, high intensity. High intensity can't be solved by instrumental learning. The high intensity dissonance carries over. So you can't inoculate that with a pre-orientation. No matter what you do, you're never going to solve that high intensity dissonance. That's a flaw in the study of broad field. So there's a lot of training and orientation to prepare people. You're not going to prepare them because it's a different kind of problem. It's a structural problem, not an individual problem. It's high intensity dissonance. And that goes for the rest of your life until the horizon's been changed. Think civil rights people who have spent their whole life working on that and still are, right? Or have died in the cause. That's never going away. You know, every single person I interviewed over time, it doesn't go away. So next slide. And that's my partner, Donna, who was standing there. Uh, artifacts of the war. So again, you're seeing it firsthand. We're talking to people that talk about it. And it's hard to see history in a visceral way. So that's very powerful. She's sort of reflecting on that because we've seen the, in the clinics people are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder still. Yes, go ahead. And these are some of the groups that we work with. So uh, these are the leaders in the Mway community, Roy and Anna, and then Earl and his wife, Damaris, and their kids. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, hanging out. There's lots of opportunities for reflecting with people. And so we have uh, lunch and dinner with Earl and his family and other community members. So uh, those are our main partners and lots of connection with the orphanage and the kids. So we're constantly meeting people and talking to people and engaging with people immersed in the environment. We have students that stay with families and do health assessments. Yes, go ahead. And then we do a lot of dialogue. This is Neri Tenorio, young man that I met when he was 15 and he was sort of a, oh, quite a charmer. Uh, didn't have a play, he lived in a place on his own. And uh, he became part of our team, speaks three languages, never, grew, um, never uh, graduated from high school. And we wanted him to facilitate the dialogue with the Mway community. Um, and then Roy and Anna have often facilitated the dialogues, but it's not us coming in there. And it's just an opportunity to have com multiple conversations. So over the years, we've continued that dialogue. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So the critique on um, high levels of dissonance and study abroad, do you think that also plays out in many expressions of international service learning or domestic service learning if we're not attentive to how we're actually constructing those programs? I mean, high dissonance is going to happen if you're going into underserved communities regardless of where they yep. are. And if we're not attentive to that, I mean, so like, is it just study abroad or is it kind of how we're approaching um, our educational programs? That's a really good question. So is anybody here immune from critically examining their assumptions? So one of the flaws, when I first sent my first chapter out for review, somebody missed understood that dissonance was about under, like this massive dissonance that you go through in an under-resourced. You can have dissonance, high intensity dissonance in a lot of places. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean massive disparities. And that's really important to understand someone's biography because they could be in a place where there's a lot of potential for examining their assumptions. So it could happen in any context. But part of it is as an educator is under, I, understanding how that dissonance happens and then what structures of learning do you have in place to help them um, uh, engage with that dissonance in a meaningful way with themselves and others. And a lot of it is also with the community members they're partnering with helps them with that because they see people like our partner Earl Bowie who lives this daily. And I've never seen someone laugh and joke and, and smile and be resilient. Uh, that he's sort of my inspiration and students have so much opportunity to talk with Earl and nurses and doctors in that environment and that's really important. Again, it's a programmatic part of it. If I didn't do that, then they would be extrapolating all sorts of and construing all sorts of meaning on that experience. Right? Some people romanticize it actually. Say, oh look at the hammocks, you know, it must be nice with the breeze. So, okay, uh, and that's the clinic. Clinical setting is very uh, 
very intense because there's three languages going on. There's different stations. There's a doctor there. It's often in a strange place, depending on where we are in a remote area. Um, but again, it, in terms of practical skills, uh, it's really powerful for the nursing students uh, to go through that. And then uh, this is uh, one of our students who's with four generations, and uh, that baby had a staph infection. And it's amazing when a student comes back and they saved a life, and what that feels like to identify staph infection and have antibiotics and intervene. Um, and that family was so, they were so connected that when she left in the airport that day, grandma came and daughter, came, mom came and daughter came and baby came. So it was just a, shows, that's in, you know, literally three weeks. And so it's just such a powerful, and I, I worked with that student over many, many years. And the metaphor that she had had a lot to do with purging. Uh, and she used that term a lot in her reflections. And it brought her, a lot of her biography into play. And, you know, some of these journals are, some of the reflections are, uh, you know, it's really, uh, you feel like you're in a privileged place when you're reading. When people start to do some soul searching, it's pretty powerful. Uh, and then these are the teams. And so again, this gives you a sense of, oh, we've accomplished so much while we've been here. You know, that's the whole uh, forming, storming, norming, performing. And then we added two more. I mean, actually the literature, I didn't realize added adjourning, but then there's mourning. And that's a really powerful uh, issue. And so they're envisioning, they're so psyched, they're gonna change the world. And then phew, they come back and everything is just in front of them and it's overwhelming. And if I would stopped there, I would have been like, hey, we accomplished a lot, woohoo!" Uh, and that was just my first picture trying to figure out how all this works, really bad graphics back in the day when we didn't have good graphics. I think that's it. So questions, sorry. That was quick, that was about as quick as I could go. Oh, we just wanted to go questions and answers. Yeah. And I disagree with the idea that when people, when there is the inclusion of empowerment and perspective, I find that extremely problematic because it's coming from a, I guess you can't, you can't give somebody power. They right. Have, they already encompass it. So how do you, how would you suggest ways to kind of, or maybe beginning areas to start rethink about how power <laughs> is? How, how, how we should think about power or how it, the verbiage when creating objectives or even creating projects yeah. to not oversimplify what power is and the meanings and purposes of how um, programs get developed. I, I think one thing is, uh, and the, you know, there's no full answer to that question, but it's a great question. I think I've struggled with the same thing. One thing is there's a great book by Ira Shore called Empowerment Education. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ira Shore's work. Um, he's an educator in the CUNY system in New York and did a talking book, a dialogue book with Paulo Freire, if you're familiar with Freire's work. Um, and uh, he's written two books, When Students Have Power <laughs> and Empowerment Education, two very pow powerful books that help with that, that very tension about empowering people. And um, I think it's more about the intentionality of talking about that and then recognizing your own the set of assumptions. Well, one, being intentional about what power is and who empowers who, right? Where it comes from and how it flows and how you negotiate it. Some of the things we were talking about last night. And having, uh, creating a structure where you can have those conversations. So climate setting, setting some ground tools, a safe place to have difficult conversations about power and how it flows. Um, and one's role and, and how it flows. Uh, and, and whether or not they're creating greater power differentials, alleviating those, and in what ways. So I think that's just the intentionality around that, including that in the reflective process. You know, having that as a topic for a discussion, a thread that runs through a program is incredibly important. And then finding some of these um, articles that are really good. There's a classic article that I loved that I was reading during my dissertation. It's in the Harvard Educational Review. It's uh, Christine Ellsworth, I think, um, uh, and maybe um, Kathleen Wheeler, but I think it's Christine Ellsworth. Both of them have some cool articles in the Harvard Educational Review, and it's called Why Doesn't This Feel Empowering? <laughs> it's a great article. Um, 
where that that she with her students really unpacks that whole notion of empowerment um, that really helped me the Kathleen Wheeler did an article called Freire and the pedagogy of difference where she takes a Freire in and builds off of it and honors Freire but then adds feminist theory to Freire which is a really cool um, angle to look at Freire which it goes into dialogue and positionality and things like that Sorry, I don't, I don't want to use like language that might be funky for some people. It's more educational language. Other questions about this? What do you think? Does it make sense? Is it affirming? Does it seem intuitive? Does it, does it seem um, useful in any way? These different processes? Yeah, there's a bunch of articles on the, the website. It's on the, if you click on the announcement for this program, there's a bunch of articles under it. So one thing that they think to me now is the, um, the role that these host families have um, in the great question. process. Um, I, I, I structure my course that the first four days we do stay in a hotel in, a, in the city of Zagreb, which is comfy and it protects them from the, all of this dissonance, from yeah. the lower dissonance, and they feel good and happy. And then when we take the train and go to the war zone, it becomes really hard on them. Some cry, some feel like discomfort, and we process that. But I never, I knew, I always knew that there is something that is really good to stay with the host family, not just because they get immersed in the culture, but it's the soothing emotionally because it normalizes, they listen to their stories. Initially, families do not open to mm -hmm. share their war stories. But then they start drinking that cup of tea or coffee together. Right. And they begin to share that. And I never really thought about this, the power, what role does host family have in the di lowering the dissonance? Yes. And, and why, what is it that these families, after years, they still keep in touch and they connected only for two weeks being there, actually 10 days only with the host family, they still stay, stay connected. So there is something deeper. And it may be that, 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 that the, the host families help them in moments that are so crucial to their own identity and that dissonance process. So I didn't... I think that's really important. You're highlighting an area that's understudied and probably underdeveloped in terms of how they're part of that process. And I totally agree. I can only say with this program and other programs I've done is the more and more I immerse people but give them the tools to have those conversations. In the literature and service learning, at least, we talk about unstructured and structured reflection. And I've often left, at least with the Nicaragua program, uh, the conversations at the dinner table and at lunch and in the families that they stay with uh, when that was a part of the program as unstructured, you know, letting those happen in informal ways um, and not prepping the families for how to engage in that because so much of it is creating that safe emotional space to be able to tell those stories and then those stories we talked about stories last night and allowing students to hear those stories but then process the stories really important and have I, so I the structured part of it is I give them multiple modes of reflection so there's journaling with a framework around I expect certain things in the journal then we have a group processing and w I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to sort of, you can frame that in different ways. Sometimes students can lead it. You can pass something that's an artifact in the community to make sure everybody says something. And you can make it um, easy to engage in by saying one good thing, one bad thing. Uh, my first experience with reflection was in Nicaragua, and it was a, a mission group that invited me to go to uh, their, what do they call it, meditation after they were doing a construction project in this community. I'm agnostic, but you know I was br I was brought up Catholic, um, so I w I'm just open-minded to how people want to process. They can experience processing, and so I went there with a Norwegian woman who also wasn't Christian, and uh, her name was Britt. Uh, and so we went to this. I was so fascinated. I thought it was such a powerful experience. They drew heavily from the Bible, and they drew out themes from the Bible. And each person was responsible uh, each day to describe the group experience and some of the stories of that day and how it related to that theme. Similar to service learning, 
reflection should be tied to learning objectives. So I want students to be able to draw from what we're learning in the classroom and from the readings and tie it to that experience or story or an interaction that they had. And I think that's what they were using the Bible for is to again draw some lessons, some uh, morals of the story, some themes, some ideas, some concepts, um, some approaches, and then tying it to their experience. And the same thing we do that in classrooms with our texts and our conversations. So there's multiple texts out there that are, and there are multiple stories. And the important thing is, one, you've got them with a host family. What a great programmatic dimension. They're engaging with people from that community in pretty deep ways over a meal, which can lower some of the stakes. You're not in a class, you're not expected to you know, know the language perfectly and, and you're not making mistakes, or you're, you're making mistakes, but feel differently about it. So uh, I think that's a really, the more and more you can have that connection with multiple people within that community with diverse perspectives is very, very important. So I, I but I don't, you know, leaving that unstructured, I'm uncomfortable with that. But there are audiences that you can also uh, prep as well. Yes, other questions? Great, great point. We have time for one more. Yes. The challenge of uh, political transformation is necessitated by the content. How can you foresee that within the academic setting? <laughs> uh, the contextual part? Uh, how do you go through that with the... Yeah, if uh, the situation necessitates uh, political transformation, yeah. It's a fantastic question. So there's big debates in the field about that, and there are traditions that bring different approaches to that question. Mesero, uh, Mesero came to Cornell a couple times when I was studying for my dissertation. He looks like Spock. Sorry, Jack. I mean, Spock's a handsome individual, but just looks like someone that has a lot of wisdom, been thinking about this, and uh, he, has a he has a very specific approach that he uh, repeats over and over again. And it's very powerful. It's very sophisticated. And there are folks at Cornell, when I was doing my doctoral studies, that drew heavily from a Freirean tradition, which is about transforming the, the word and the world. Um, and that the way in which we understand the world, by being more aware of the oppressive tendencies, it necessitates action toward transforming it. And people felt like Mesereau's theory uh, put a lot of onus on individual transformation and not so much social transformation. And there are some critiques about that. Mesro has this really uh, interesting comment that he makes all the time. And he says, uh, um, predetermining the nature of transformation, whether it's individual or social, is tantamount to indoctrination. So think about that. Uh, predetermining what individual and social transformation is, is tantamount to indoctrination. You can use this theory for bad things. You can sell a corporation and say, you guys are so smart. I want you to critically examine the assumptions about exploitation and use everything, all of our critical understandings of that and make as much of a profit of the world without thinking about planet. So you can use critical examination of assumptions. Cults do it. So there's lots of... So it's a very complicated methodology that one has to be incredibly sensitive to that. And as an educator, you have a lot of power to influence how somebody sees the end point of transformation. So he argues that, and I take that into consideration, and I agree with that, actually, that you can't predetermine individual and social transformation. I think it's unethical, and I also think it's tantamount to indoctrination. Having said that, for me, the most important learning outcome is the ability to critically examine your assumptions, the harm that it causes yourself and others. And if you're good at that, typically that individual social transformation will take you, I think, I believe, it'll take you to a better place. Um, and over the years, uh, I, I've felt comfortable with that way of approaching it, um, that the goal is to get people to have a strong understanding of the framework for engaging in critical reflection. And what's important about that as well, and I want people to take this away when I, when I use this methodology, is that the best you can get at is your best tentative judgment. So if you're engaging in a problem and you're critically examining your assumptions, the assumptions of others, and you've engaged with multiple stakeholders in the community, there is no accurate test 
for what's right and what's wrong, but you've taken the time to critically examine and be open to examining your own assumptions and the assumptions of others, and you come up with your best tentative judgment on what the most appropriate action with in concert with others, in dialogue with others. That's why all those dimensions are really important. And they're, they're, they're very important to the process. Does that make sense? Does that help? There are some people that might not agree with that, but I think Mesereau uh, has a good approach to that dilemma. And what's hard about that is predetermining learning outcomes. <laughs> if it's transformational, assessment actually asks you to do that backwards design, identify your learning outcomes, <laughs> and then test against them. And transformational learning, I don't know what someone's frame of reference is before they come into a class. So I can't, I see patterns. So there are patterns that I've identified that I think are actually really positive social goods. Those six patterns that I mentioned. And if anybody's interested in that, I would be more than happy. The articles that I've written go into those patterns and what moral transformation looks like, what intellectual transformation looks like, political transformation, spiritual, cultural, and personal, and social. So, um, you know, that if you engage with that, I'd be happy to have you know more conversations about this